I used to live with the fear of rejection. Always thinking, what if no one cares? What if no one understands? But when I encountered Jesus, my identity was no longer founded on how others felt about me or how they saw me. Jesus loves me, not because of who I am or what I've done, but because of who he is. And now I live with the affirmation of knowing that who I am is not validated by people, but by the cross. I used to live with the fear of failure, the fear of making a mistake, and fearing the consequences that I would have to face. But on the cross, Jesus showed that he has overcome the greatest consequence yet, death. Today I live with the security of knowing that fearing God is greater than fearing failure, and that his protection conquers all. I used to carry the weight of sin and shame, of certain things that I've done in the past and things that were done to me. I felt damaged and unworthy of any kind of love. I felt this constant need to earn that love from others. But Jesus has set me free. Jesus met me in my brokenness. Because of his work on the cross, he exchanges that sin and shame with healing and restoration. Today I know that in Christ I am whole, forgiven, and loved. The perfect love of Jesus Christ has changed me forever. I used to live my life very judgmental towards others, thinking that I'm better than other people. Very legalistic. At the same time, very insecure when people say that uh, I'm not good enough. Until I met Jesus, where He showed my brokenness, shed lights on my sin, and really showed me how much He loves me when He died on the cross. In short, I was blind, but now I see. Hi, my name is Maggie. I was afraid because I was struggle with my challenges, challenges in business, and also I just lost my baby last week. But God showed His love and His faithfulness to me. In His presence, I can feel the joy and the peace that I never experienced before. Now I'm not afraid anymore because I know that He always be with me. He is still the same God, the God of miracle, the way maker, the promise keeper. He is the one who changed my life. He is the one who always stand by my side and He is the one who always give me strength. I used to always base my identity and my self-worth on my successes and my achievements. So in difficult times, I've often felt very lonely, empty, and even sometimes ashamed of myself. But Jesus showed me His perfect and unconditional love. He showed me that my identity can only be found in Him. So today, despite of the circumstances that I face, I can confidently say that I am saved, that I am loved, and that I am a child of God. I used to be very insecure and live in fear, not knowing what my future held, until Jesus came into my life and He showed me that He was a good, good Father that I can trust my life and my future with. And He showed me His ultimate love when He died for me on the cross. I was always trying to meet people's expectations in order to gain respect and fit in. But Jesus told us that He sees the heart and no matter what we can do, no matter what we have achieved, He still loves us. Therefore, I'm not secure because my God loves me for who I am. I used to keep thinking about my patience, mistakes, and failures that often made me guilt, discouraged, had negative thoughts, and even felt hopeless about my future. But Jesus, who is rich in mercy and compassion, He died for me. He forgave all my sins. And now He lives inside of me, made me into a new creation, and continued to show me His unfailing love. I live knowing that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Today, I live my life remembering that I am forgiven and my future is filled with hope in Christ. I used to struggle with lots of insecurities and it resulted to self-hatred. But at that point of my life was when I met Jesus. And I learned that on the cross, Jesus Christ, He willingly died and gave His life for me. And that was an unconditional love that I've never felt before. And as I surrendered my life to Him, He gave me a new identity as a child of God. And that in Him, I am fully accepted and deeply loved. And that just gave me a new sense of hope and purpose in life. 
So now I can confidently live being fully secure in the identity that is defined by him alone. I used to be a very ignorant person, didn't really care on what was happening with people around me in their circumstances. But as I follow Jesus, as as I seek God every day, um, He changed my heart slowly, give me more empathy, uh, compassion to help and to serve uh, people. And, and I, mean, I mean, that's the lifestyle of Jesus. He loved people and He served, and, uh, and that's what I am willing as well. And God has changed my heart. I used to be an insecure person who looks for my worth in people and in things. But every time I would just be disappointed until Jesus opened my eyes to who He is, to a love that I had never known and experienced before, that He died for my sins on the cross before I even knew Him. So now I am fully secure knowing that my worth is defined on His perfect love and sacrifice. I used to live in this constant fear of the consequences of the wrong ways that I did in the past, of the wrong decision making that I did in the past, until Jesus came and really um, assured me that I am His beloved daughter, He is my good father, and that He has forgiven me of all the things that I did in the past, and that my future is bright and safe in His hands because He is my father. I grew up trying my very best to please people. I was living my life out of fear and condemnations. Whenever I face rejections, disappointments, I would blame myself thinking it's my fault. But Jesus he showed me that He truly is the fountain of living water. In His mercy, He revealed to me that only His love and nothing else can satisfy my soul. Today, I live in conviction that nothing can separate me from His love. His cross assures me that I can now walk in freedom, forever satisfied and content. I used to be so insecure about myself, but Jesus has freed me. He took my sin and shame to the cross and gave me a new identity. Good morning, church. Welcome to the At Home Together online service from Prayer Center Church. It's so great to see you guys again. Um, virtually. Um, if for those of you who are new, my name is Edwin and we are Pray Center. We are a church that exists to love God and help you follow Jesus. Now we are going to get together to worship and praise the Lord. And I pray so that we seize this time to really seek after the Lord. And I hope that you will get a personal revelation of who God is. But before that, we're going to go to Grace Budiman for her to share some word of exhortation from the book of 2 Corinthians. Good morning, church. Allow me to open up with 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. God of all comfort, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. This week I had experienced an immense amount of stress where I allowed um, fear and anxiousness to just rule over my heart, over an outcome that I had no control over. I learned the exhaustion that comes when we allow these things to rule over our hearts. But this scripture, what it's saying and what's, what it's reminding us is that God is a God who comforts. It's not a temporary or a band-aid fix, but it's an everlasting comfort. He gives us the comfort that will not only sustain us, but it will give us the ability to comfort others, those around us, our brothers and sisters who are also suffering. We don't have to be paralyzed by stress, fear and doubt, but we can choose for God to reign over our hearts, to reign over our circumstances and comfort us. God gives us the armor to navigate through and finish this journey with victory. 
allow me to pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God who comforts. And Father, here today, we invite you to rule over our hearts, to rule over our circumstances. We don't want to be paralyzed by stress, fear and doubt. We don't want to fight this alone, but we want to fight it hand in hand with you. We want to go to we want to go with you, Father. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you just embrace us. You reign over us. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
Hey everyone, today I will be concluding our three month study of the book of Daniel. When our senior pastor planned this teaching series last year, we had no idea we would be in the middle of a pandemic today. So I'm grateful to God for directing us to study this book. I believe that the revelations and the lessons God has given us in the past three months have prepared and strengthened our faith for this crisis. If you have been track, if you have not been tracking with us, I encourage you to read the book of Daniel, particularly chapters one to six, where you will find the narrative of his life in exile. You can also listen to our podcast from February to hear our teachings of every chapter. Before we get into the teaching of the word, let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness. Lord, we are here today because you are faithful. Lord, we believe that it is a, the living hope within us. It is you, Lord, that has, that has sustained us these days, God, during uh, the toughest times, during the darkest moments. Your faithfulness has been the one that has truly sustained our lives. And so, Lord, we just ask that as we come to your word, that you would remind us again of the hope that is found in you. You would strengthen our faith. Lord, bring comfort to us. I ask that you would speak to every one of us who are tuning in. You are a personal God and you would speak into our situations, into our lives, into our hearts, Lord. Uh, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would make your presence tangible to everyone who is seeking after you and who is desiring to connect with you, Lord. We ask that you would anoint the teaching and the preaching of your word today. We, ask, we believe that transformation is only something that you can do. And so we ask for your word to transform our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Daniel's life as an exile in Babylon began with much suffering and grief. Yet he followed the prophet Jeremiah's advice to the exiles to work for the peace and the prosperity of Babylon. He took on a Babylonian name and he learned the Babylonian culture and language and he had a successful political career under four different Babylonian kings throughout his time in exile. But through all those years, Daniel's heart remained orientated toward God. At the beginning of his life in exile, we read in chapter one that Daniel refused to eat the king's food and to violate God's law. He resolved to stay true to his God-given identity. And after almost 70 years in exile, when Daniel had now become a powerful political figure who had tremendous influence in the land, Daniel remained unconditionally loyal to the Lord. We learn this in chapter six. Not even the threat of death would make Daniel bow down to any idol or king. Regardless of any circumstance he faced, Daniel worshipped the Lord. He never forgot who he was. And because he was faithful, God used Daniel's life to make his name known. Daniel's life became a story about the living, eternal God. All through his years in exile, Daniel was a witness of God's might, God's sovereignty and wisdom. Evil and proud kings repented and a nation was led to worship the living God. As I was prayerfully reflecting on the life of Daniel, I was led to this verse in Romans chapter 12. The apostle Paul defines a life of worship as this. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Apostle Paul uses the analogy of sacrifice, referring to Old Testament practice of animal sacrifices in the temple as a form of spiritual worship to God. 
he says that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, these two words are contradictory in itself because the idea of animal sacrifices meant that they would be dead. But what Paul is reminding the church is that Jesus died as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins so that in him we would die to our old life of sin and be raised to a new life. In other words, if you are living in Christ, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Jesus paid for your salvation with his own life. So the Christian life is about worshiping God with the life that he purchased for us. Our lives do not belong to ourselves anymore. They now belong to God. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, sorry, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. The Christian life is a call to self-denial, to deny our will, to deny our desires, to deny our life. The Bible says that if we keep following our desires, our life will not go well. And then if we look back in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, Jesus says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. In this call to die to ourselves is the promise of being awakened to an eternal life, the one we were originally created for. You see, Daniel lived this way. In the Bible, Babylon was a symbol of any human institution that is proud, that is godless, and that seeks its own glory. Daniel may have looked like a Babylonian and he may have worked for the Babylonians, but he lived with the conviction that his life belonged to God. He didn't live for himself. He didn't pursue the pleasures offered by Babylon. Conformity is not a behavioral matter. It's a heart matter. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees, the religious teachers, for looking religious and doing religious things, but their hearts were self-centered and attached to the materialistic things of this world. You see, the exile caused Daniel to abandon the future plans he may have had. It separated him, separated him from his family and took away everything he may have found comforting in his old life. But Daniel was able to embrace his new life as an exile because he remained connected with God, the love of his life and the Lord of his life. This pandemic may have caused us to cancel or postpone a lot of the plans we have made, we may have made for this year. I know that as a family, we were planning to be in Spain this May. Some of you may be feeling a sense of separation from your loved ones, even just desiring a, a hug from them. Some of you may be dealing with the loss of things that you took in comfort in before this crisis and it may be something as simple as simply the freedom to go to Chadston or perhaps the loss that you have experienced in this season whatever it may be has left you somewhat lost or insecure and perhaps disorientated but this pandemic has not separated you from God it has not changed your God-given identity and it has not taken away your God-given purpose. Whatever circumstance you are in today, you can continue to worship God and to witness for him. We're going to look at three ways Daniel cultivated a life of worship and witness. The first thing we see in Daniel's life is that he had a daily habit of communing with God. Daniel was a man of prayer. When he found himself in a crisis, prayer was always his first response. If we look back in chapter two, when Daniel finds out that the king was going to kill him and his friends because 
No one could interpret his disturbing dream. Daniel's immediate response was to ask the king for more time and then pray. Daniel didn't ask the king to spare his life. He didn't even ask the king what the dream was. Daniel's first response was to pray to the one who held his life. Our response to crisis reveals who we believe is in control of our lives. Daniel believed that his lives, his life, sorry, was in God's hands, not his own hands, not even the king's hands. And when God answers his prayer, Daniel doesn't run straight to the king. He takes a moment to first praise the Lord. God was more valuable to him than even his own life. And then in chapter six, we learn that even until his old age, Daniel ne never gave up the habit to pray. In fact, it was so predictable that Daniel would pray three times a day that his enemies knew that they could use it against him to, to kill him. In verse 10 of chapter six, it says, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he, he had always done, giving thanks to his God. This was Daniel's response when he found out that he was headed to the lion's den. Daniel did not lose sight of the reality that he belonged to God, that God was in control of his life spiritual family. Your life is in God's hands. You belong to God, so He will take care of you. It is more important now than ever that we seek God, we embrace His love and His grace for us, that we fill our minds with His truth and we hold on to His promises. A couple of years ago, I was at a low moment in my life. One particular night, I locked myself in my room and I just cried out to the Lord. I released a lot of my frustration. I was trying to be as honest as I could. I complained to the Lord for the situation that I was in. And then I saw my Bible on my bedside table. And so I opened it to the book of Psalms. And I was hoping to turn to a psalm that was written when the author was desperate and depressed. Because as you know, if you've read the book of Psalms, there's a lot of those psalms. But the only psalm that I could turn to were the ones that caused my mouth to confess God's pr praise. I remember that it was the whole, as if the Holy Spirit had supernaturally taken hold of my mouth and I could, all I could say was, praise you God, praise you God, praise you God, praise you God. I will never forget that moment. You see, when I entered that time of prayer, I was in heartache, but then the Lord turned it around and he made my heart to see him. He made that moment about him and the thing about that is God is awesome and he is always awesome prayer doesn't change God it changes us praising God will put things into perspective we will begin to see how big God is and how small our problems are the truth about God will overcome any feelings we have in this situation Hope is not found in the world. It won't be found in the news. Hope is only found in the word of God. We wouldn't know how much hope is contained in the promises of God until we get to know the God who made them. There are so many distractions keeping us from spending time with God. Perhaps it's our work or a TV series or even a game. And I'm not here to condemn you. But I want to remind you that our lives as Christians are not for us to rule, they're for us to steward. God owns our lives and, he plan and His plans for them are better than whatever we can imagine. So we are to steward these moments well. Because not only 
is it true that our lives belong to the Lord? But that also means that the moments that we have been given today also belong to him. And so let's make them count. In the book of John, chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If we truly believe the words that Jesus says here, then our relationship with him means everything. God has called us primarily to be in relationship with him, not to do things for him. We were designed to abide in God, not to perform for him. And Daniel's life demonstrates that private worship will lead to public witness. You see, when God saves Daniel in the lion's den, King Darius spreads the good news to the whole world. He said, but Daniel's role was to trust God. God was the one who saved. Witness grows out of worship and prayer. A witness is not something we do. We are to be witnesses. Daniel's faith enabled God to move and to be seen. And as we abide in the Lord, we will become people who walk by faith and not by sight. And our lives will be marked by God's supernatural presence and power. Only people who, whose hearts burn a flame for passion for the Lord will shine his light. Only those who take joy in the Lord will be compelled to loving action. The second thing that Daniel did to cultivate a life of worship and witness was he was obedient to the word of God. Daniel was obedient to God's laws. He didn't live life on his own terms or even on the Babylonians' terms. He lived life on God's terms. And because Daniel knew the word of God, he was sensitive to the moments when the Babylonian way or the Babylonian law would make him compromise God's laws. And in those moments, Daniel would always choose to obey God. When Daniel interprets King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams in chapters two and chapters four, we see that he delivers the interpretations of these dreams faithfully, even when it meant announcing God's judgment to these evil, proud kings. He didn't even try to make the interpretation less offensive. He delivered the word of God as it was. And I believe that Daniel's courage to obey God came from the same conviction that his life was in God's hands. Daniel was committed to being a sacrifice unto God. Church, God does not just intend for us to be recipients of his grace. He has called us to be instruments of it to the world. You see, resting in the finished work of Christ, it frees us from trying to prove ourselves. It lifts us out of the selfishness, knowing that there's no need to strive. There's no need to try and make a better life for ourselves. There's no need to be ahead of others. There's no need to do better than other people. By embracing the grace of God, we are free to be honest with our weaknesses and with our failings and at the same time serve others sacrificially. As we wait for God to answer our prayers this season, you can be the answer to someone else's prayer. The testimonies we share about God's goodness from a place of pain and suffering is a message that can bless so many people in this season. People need to know about the hope that lives in you, how God has met you and why your faith has made a difference in your trials. God has called the church to embody his love and his character to the world. It's our time to rise and be the body of Christ. Just like Daniel's obedience became a platform for God to reveal himself to the Babylonians and to the world, your obedience can reveal God to the people around you. Technology has made it possible for us to keep building relationships with one another and with the lost. 
in a time of crisis, especially during a, a global pandemic. So many people are realizing their need for God. We have learned from history that it's in these moments of crisis that people tend to ask, where is God? Church, we have the answer to that question. This is our time to spread the gospel of Jesus, our living hope. Who do you know that needs to hear your personal testimony of how Jesus changed your life? The gospel is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes and the Holy Spirit will empower us to proclaim it. The power of the gospel does not rest on us. It rests on God. So we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be ashamed. We don't belong to this world. We belong to God. So let's make these moments count for eternity. Imagine what the church would be like. Imagine what this place is going to be like when we can finally gather again if we simply obeyed today. I don't know about you, but I sometimes wrestle with the guilt that I may not be doing enough or sometimes I just feel bad because I see the condition of our world. I see uh, the lives of other people and I realize that they're doing it much tougher than I am in this season. And I feel sometimes that my contribution may barely make a dent in the grand scheme of things. But as, I, as that thought crossed my mind one day, the Holy Spirit reminded me that God is a personal God. Every person matters to Him. I may not be able to reach everybody, but the people that I can love, that I can be generous to, that I can serve, they matter to God just as much. We may not be able to set the world right, but we can continue to spread the love and the truth of the only one who can, one person at a time. God doesn't need us to save the world. He wants us to be obedient. And if you don't know where to start, can I encourage you to simply pray Pray for the people around you. Pray for everybody that may be suffering in this season. The third thing that Daniel did to cultivate a life of worship and witness is that he worshipped God with other believers. I believe that Daniel's friendship with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego was crucial in helping him remain faithful to God during his time in exile. In chapter 1, when Daniel resolved to not violate God's laws, he did it together with his friends. And then in chapter 2, when Daniel explains uh, the matter to his friends that the king was going to kill them if they were not going to give him an interpretation of his dream, he urges his friends to then join him in pleading for the mercy of God to reveal that the king's dream to them. You see, if a piece of burning coal is removed from the fire, it's going to cool off. But if it's put back in the middle of the fire, it will burn again. The same is true of the Christian life. We need to continue to fellowship with one another. Otherwise, we're going to cool off spiritually. And this season is not the time to cool off spiritually. Don't let these social distancing restrictions with one another hinder us from getting deeper in our relationships. We can continue to bless each other with our words. You know, words are powerful. They have the power to strengthen someone or to leave them in a hopeless and in a weak state. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25 says, Let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, for, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Church, can I remind you that we cannot do this alone, especially through a season like this. We need to walk with our Sadrach, Meshach and Abednego. We were not created to just enjoy our relationship with God, but also to, 
uh, to enjoy our relationship with one another. Let's not settle for relationships that simply meet our personal happiness agenda. We need to have real friends who will never lead us away from God. Let's be intentional about investing in those friendships this season and help stir our affections for God. Let's be intentional about encouraging one another, sharing hope, praying for one another and building each other's faith. In the book of John, chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One day, this church, our church, will be gathering in this place again. And the world is going to see whether our relationships with one another were deep enough to sustain us in the midst of adversity. So the three things that Daniel did to cultivate a life of worship and witness are the first, he committed to a daily habit of communing with God. He kept praying and praising the Lord every day. Number two, he obeyed the word of God. And number three, he worshiped with other believers. At the end of the day, Daniel was an ordinary man who was devoted to worshiping an extraordinary God. He believed his life was in God's hands and he lived as if his life belonged to God. Because of this, God became the hero of Daniel's story and made Daniel's life significant. You and I are part of a greater story. One day we will no longer be on this earth, but God's story will continue to unravel. And today, God wants you to be part of fulfilling His glorious plans and His mission here on earth. Church, we have the privilege of being the hands and feet of God. We have the privilege of making God's love and life tangible in the lives of others simply by our relationships with them. As I close, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of John, chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is revealing that we all have this spiritual hunger and thirst that only He can satisfy. I find this interesting that in Australia, the lockdown restrictions have been determined based on what is deemed as essential activity and non-essential activity. I believe that God is reminding us of what is truly essential in our lives this season. Just like food and water are essential for the human body to survive, Jesus is our greatest need. Jesus is the bread of life, the living water. Only He can satisfy the hunger and the thirst of our hearts. Only a relationship with Jesus can fill our emptiness. C.S. Lewis said, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. The human heart was not made for this world. It was made to find joy in praising an eternal God. It is impossible, therefore, to feel lonely if we have a deep friendship with the one who created us. We may have, we may have lost many things because of this pandemic, but perhaps in losing the things of this world, we have found our greatest need. The God who created you for himself is calling you into a relationship, into a deeper relationship with him today. Will you respond? If you have felt far from God, perhaps you used to come to church and you stopped going for some time, or perhaps you grew up in a Christian family and you decided it wasn't for you for whatever reason, or perhaps you've desired to always find out who God is. If that is you, and today you want to respond to God's invitation into a deeper relationship 
with him. Can I encourage you to pray this prayer with me? And I just want to encourage our spiritual family to pray along. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe God died for my sins and rose from the dead. And today I turn from my sins. I invite you to come into my heart and my life. And I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't belong to a spiritual family and you are based in Melbourne, can I encourage you to reach out to us, send us a comment or a message, and we'd love to help you with your next steps in following Jesus. To everyone else who has tuned in, I just want to thank you for fellowshipping with us. And if you are part of our church, I am excited for the day that we get to gather again in this place. But until that day comes, we're going to keep praying for you, we're cheering you on, and we're believing that God's going to sustain you in this season. In Jesus' name, why don't we end this time of fellowship with praising the Lord again. be blessed by series book of Daniel so in two weeks time after Mother's Day we will continue with the books of Galatians let me pray for you the Lord will bless you and keep you he makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you he turned his face toward you and give you peace. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stay healthy, keep your distance, and God bless you. Have a great Sunday. 
Wow, what an amazing service to end our three months journey unraveling the book of Daniel. Again, as Ruth mentioned, we have no idea that this COVID-19 will happen when we begin this series, but what an appropriate, even prophetic um, direction from our pastor for us to unravel this book. Our prayer is that you have been ministered and that peace and joy come upon your life as you and I all gather at home to worship and listen to the Word of God together. Again, if you need a prayer or just to say hi, don't hesitate, just contact us from the chat box, wherever you are, WhatsApp, Instagram, or our contact form in our website. As we are about to close our service and also close our corporate worship, there will be some application and prayer questions in the end of this service. If you have a live group, please do join your Zoom or Google Hangout meeting and discuss with them again. Even though we are not together, doesn't mean we can't share our life together. And for those of you that are new and you want to join, again, don't forget that there's a lot of ways to do it, contact forms and stuff. With that, we conclude this service and hope to see you guys again next week. God bless you.